So why do we want to do functional mammogram pap spectroscopy? And specifically, why do we want to do it in this specific study on infants? Um, because uh, we want to be able to understand reflexes such as uh, palmar and plantar, meaning moving your hands and moving your feet, um, and in regards to cerebral palsy. Uh, there was a talk earlier today that talked about this, which uh, I think it really uh, hit home. Uh, so if we can understand the neurodevelopmental um, changes or the neurophysiological changes in the brain of the infant, then we can catch the problem early on. And as Dr. Bennett mentioned in his keynote this morning, we need to catch the problem before it happens. So when is the best time to catch a problem? Before the brain develops. And this is a kind of like an overall goal. And specific to the study is, we want to establish in a clinical setting the feasibility of doing functional neuroinfant spectroscopy. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is because most studies have been research uh, um, based. We want to be able to do something that's really uh, realistic, meaning we're not repeating off on, off on, off on paradigms that we do with fMRI or typical diffuse optical tomography or functional nerve spectroscopy studies where you have to average. We want to be able to say in a real life clinical environment or a real world environment, can one signal be sufficient for us to measure and acquire? And in this case, uh, in the infants in the neonatal intensive care unit. Oops. All right. Uh, the overall um, goal of just doing our studies in, in our lab is we want to be able to take uh, uh, an initial diagnostic from the clinic, which typically would go to positron to the radiology department, where you have positron definition tomography or functional MRI to further uh, narrow a problem, for instance, whether it's epilepsy or some kind of functional issue, um, and take that and essentially put those to the side and use functional near infrared spectroscopy as an alternative. And specifically, it's going to be a low-cost, low portable alternative and non-ionizing, whereas opposed to, if we look at the PET, we have ionizing. So I have both expensive, non-portable ionizing, only specific to the positron emission tomography. Both, all of those can give us cortical errors activation, um, but functional near infrared spectroscopy is the only one that's going to give us continuous monitoring real time in the real world. And on the right hand side there, you see the image of oxyhemoglobin changing. changing. Uh, I'd like to talk about this later on, but some of that data is good, some of that data is not good. And these are some of the things we have to understand and recognize. Although it's a pretty picture, not all of it is good data, okay? So the theory behind near infrared spectroscopy is just light scattering, absorption, we're pretty much taking like a pulse ox, we'll put a near infrared light on one side, typically you measure the detector on the other side, and that's what you see uh, in the top left figure, uh, where it's a continuous wave system, you have a signal coming in, it's attenuated, you measure the signal coming out. Uh, so that's the beer Lambert's law. But with regards to what we're doing when we're essentially putting like EEG style caps on the head, whether it's an infant or adult, we actually have to modify the equation ever so slightly to account for the distance penetrating into the tissue and watching the diffuse op optical properties uh, of the scattering absorption coming back and detecting it at a distance. Uh, and depending on how we set up the source detector separations, we can actually design it such that we're measuring deeper into the tissue versus other places in, in the uh, tissue there. And we need to do this with at least two wavelengths. Uh, and of course in the near infrared, uh, it could be 690, it could be 830, but at least two wavelengths. And the reason why we need two wavelengths is because we need to recover oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin measurements. So we have two equations, two unknowns, and we can recover it that way. So we recruited 13 preterm pre neonates, uh, and we used a near scalp system in order to measure uh, the functional changes while we're doing Palmer and plantar tasks. Uh, we only use four detectors, eight, di or eight diodes, or photo detectors, oh, excuse me, four sources, eight detectors. We have more sources and detectors, but we found out that, especially for the neonatal brain, that would be overkill with regards to the sources and detectors, so we narrowed it down. Uh, for adults, of course, we can add more. This is, these are the demographics of our children. Half of them were boys, half of them were girls. Um, they all had issues. Um, um, and uh, we measured, we, we collected their SARNOT score, EEG abnormality, abnormality uh, measurement, uh, measured the 
uh, their circumference and uh, gestational age, and we took all those and we tried to correlate it with the signals that we were measuring. So we uh, acquired a total of 162 somatic stimuli, uh, and what we did, we wanted to characterize the signal, the hemodynamic response, if you will, from the near infrared spectroscopy perspective. And we looked at the latency, the duration, and the amplitude, and on the graph on the bottom right, we defined our latencies, the time right after we uh, apply the stimulus, uh, and the duration, uh, or uh, in the duration after the stimulus is applied, uh, all the way to uh, as the, the signal goes up to peak and comes back down to baseline. And we had a hypothesis that in these children that there will be bilateral activation, meaning there isn't going to be lateralization this early in the in this in these children. Okay. Um, Basic uh, data analysis, we use Homer 2 package along with our own MATLAB script to uh, analyze the data. Wavelet filters were used to minimize motion, to remove motion artifacts. Uh, Bandpass filters were used to minimize neurophysiological noise. Okay? And statistics were uh, written in our, uh, our version 3.12. We removed extreme outliers from our data, and we, in our statistics, we adjusted for EEG scores. Uh, time one versus time two, I didn't mention, we actually had longitudinal studies. About six patients came back for time two and SARMAT scores. So from the 162 stimuli, we got 95, which gave us good, reliable data. 37 of those were hand, 42 from feet, and 16 oral motor or pacifier sucking. Okay? Uh, and we measured signals from both right, right and left hemisphere. Uh, this is an overall summary of the, the data we got and the amplitude with regards to hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, and deoxyhemoglobin. In this case, although we know that the uh, bold signal or the uh, deoxyhemoglobin is more related to the bold signal, or at least, excuse me, in the fMRI we're, we're measuring the deoxyhemoglobin when we're doing that uh, with regards to the bold. Uh, with regards to near infrared spectroscopy, we're looking at both the oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, but because oxyhemoglobin gives us a, a bigger amplitude and easier uh, uh, signal to see, we focused more on that and we looked at the statistics. Uh, and this is data showing that we are actually indeed getting signals uh, as a result of these three different stimuli in the infants, both, both left and right, and we looked at duration, latency, and amplitude. So if we look at the amplitude um, across all three stimuli, we have we have foot, hand, and pacifier, both left and right hemisphere, on the left side there for deoxyhemoglobin, and then on the right we have it for oxyhemoglobin. And uh, essentially, the signal amplitude is um, about the same for all uh, three different stimuli across all the infants. Uh, if we look at the latency, uh, the time for the signal to pretty much start going up, uh, again, the same thing across all three stimuli. Uh, and um, uh, left and right hemisphere, so no hemispheric differences yet in the amplitude or latency of the hemodynamic signal. However, if we look at the duration, meaning how long the, the signal is activated, the oxyhemoglobin is uh, really staying up before it comes back down. Uh, foot, and, foot and hand, or planter or palmer, uh, we're essentially the same, but when we look at pacifier, it actually stays a little more sustained. It's, it's a little longer duration with regards to the data there. Uh, so the activation stays on higher. Okay, and uh, I think uh, I missed the slide. I'm just, uh, yeah, okay, we're good. So why are we doing this study? Of course, the overall picture, we need an alternative system that we can use in the real world uh, that's portable. But even more specific to the neonates, we want to be able to understand the maturation of the neonatal brain, uh, normal brain and dysfunction brain. Okay, and if we can understand the, these physiological functions, then maybe we can uh, step in for some kind of diagnostic or some kind of therapy.